So i uh, going to start answering some questions here and eating lunch from Mainland Pokey. Had to advertise for him because it's awesome and I go there way too much. Um, yeah, so first question uh, about how did I start my entrepreneurship journey? Um, basically started at a young age. I honestly, since I was six years old, gone around buying and selling things and like figuring out ways to make money. And, uh, you know, started by literally collecting things around the house that I thought people would want when I was six and walking door to door selling it. And then uh, from there realized, you know, taking things from my parents' nightstands and things that I thought they weren't using was probably not the best idea. My big first uh, endeavor was in Beanie Babies when I was nine. Uh, when I was eight, I told my parents I wanted an electric guitar and wanted to start playing music. And they, uh, they said, great, go get a job. So I did, and I started, you know, my, again, first entrepreneurial thing, buying and selling Beanie Babies, and ended up making a few thousand dollars as a nine-year-old. Bought the guitar, bought a, bicycle, a BMX at the time, and saved some money for a car from all that. So that was fun. And then from there, uh, you know, just always liked the idea of building businesses. Um, I, you know, fast forward, I started another business while I was in college, a junior in college. A friend of mine approached me about building out this storm, stormwater maintenance company which is basically, you know, filtering storm drains. And uh, we launched this business. I did all the sales, marketing, and actually legal work for it. Uh, and then I actually wanted to finish school. So I went back to school and left it to him. And then, you know, f fast forward, graduated, went into real estate three days before the banking industry collapsed and started going, okay, well, I got to figure this out now. Uh, and ended up, long story short, having three different e-commerce companies over the past nine years. Uh, first one was in music, the last two in fashion, all did pretty well. And then uh, three and a half years ago, started consulting and saw that everyone out there was dealing with the same problems I dealt with myself with my own companies, which is it's really hard to find good marketers. Like there's just this lack of, uh, you know, when it comes to hiring marketers in-house, good ones tend to be expensive. That doesn't make sense. And then on the agency side, which really is the other option, 95% of agencies seem to have no clue what they're doing. And I just got sick of it, it's dealing with these people that were just selling snake oil. And so decided to hire a team of people that would work the way I wanted them to work. And through that, started with seven people, went back to companies and said everything's a la carte, month to month kind of marketing thing. And then, you know, long story short, we've been around three years now and we've grown to over 80 people. So that is how we got going. I'm going to try to keep up with these questions. So what opportunities does Snapchat have that IG and Facebook are missing the boat on? Um, I honestly wouldn't take myself as an, a Snapchat expert, so I'd be careful on that. But I do think from my perspective, it's the uh, first off, the hardware play is interesting. I think that, you know, I've messed with uh, spectacles and I think that there's something there that, you know, bridging out of the digital world is actually a really cool thing. I also think that obviously their engagement's insane. I think their big challenge, Snapchat, is that the advertising doesn't work. It's a different context from the way Facebook and Instagram work. And from a marketing perspective, it's going to be really hard to make that fix that. So I... Uh, you know, that being said, I think it's going to be really important to see how they develop a more integrated marketing approach or they're going to end up like uh, Twitter, where they're just trying to throw advertising at something that really advertising is, it's not a good platform for advertising. People are too engaged and too lean forward on Snapchat for advertising to work. So that, that would be my answer to that question. Uh, next, uh, best advice a mentor gave you that you still use? Hmm. Let me think on that for a second because I've gotten, had a lot of good advice in the past. Uh, I'd say swing the bat. I mean, that's a simple piece of advice that has really stuck with me because when we're trying to decide whether we should go for something, whether we should try something, etc., the idea of just swinging the bat and just going for it and then honestly figuring out from there gets us into problems. We, As we put it, we've hit a lot of speed bumps, but at the end of the day, we end up on top because... You know, indecision, I think, is the biggest enemy of success. It's you have to make a decision and go or not and decide that's not what we're going to doing. But just going for it, just doing it is really like the biggest driver. And I think that, you know, it was encouragement more than advice back in the day when I was like, you know, in the middle of my second e-commerce company, we were struggling, et cetera. And I was like, God, you know, is this am I ever going to be this like booming success I want to be? And it was that feedback of like, you're swinging the bat, you'll get there. And I think that's true. I think the biggest difference I see between if you take all successful people and all unsuccessful people, 
the one difference that's going to be consistent is that they're people that execute and get things done and just go for it. And I think that's important. Um, how do I balance work, personal life with a busy schedule? Yeah, so schedule is insane for me. I mean, I actually was almost late to this, even though I gave myself a cushion, had a client meeting almost uh, and go over way too much and like literally had to race back to my office. So got here, you know, thank God. But that's not unusual. My, my schedule is really nuts. And that being said, uh, I don't really believe that that needs to be separated. It's a kind of thing I've realized. My closest friend, not closest friends, but a lot of my friends, a lot of people I work with overlap. I, I go, like the example being, I've been skiing, I think seven times this year, and four of them were for work. Like I went with people I do business with, I, we, I made money going and doing these things, but I went and had fun skiing. You know, my girlfriend and I both actually have jobs that take us around the country and we actually try to plan those tri trips together so like at night and when we're hanging out we get to when we're done with meetings for the day we get to spend time together and it's a balance in the sense of like you can actually combine the two you know if i have to go to new york for a meeting well i can also go to new york and enjoy a restaurant i've been wanting to try and those kind of things so i think that the idea of separating the two is not entrepreneurial i think if you're planning on being an entrepreneur which is not for most people if you really plan on like devoting your life and becoming this thing, you know, you really have to live what you're working on for a long time. And that this is from my perspective, but I think it, with that comes finding a way to balance both. Um, where did Hawk come from in your agency name? So a uh, little fun story and good piece of advice I got. I actually was gonna call it Growth Hacker Group when I was starting out. And I, uh, I quickly got the advice from a friend that had just signed Walmart to advertise with them. And he looked at me and he said, do you think a Walmart would ever sign a contract with Growth Hacker Group? And I said, that's a good point. And he's like, yeah, just keep it simple. And it was great advice. I uh, grew up in Ojai, a small town north of LA, and always loved red-tailed hawks. So calling it Hawk Media uh, with a red logo seemed fitting. On top of that, I uh, you know, was playing around with it and realized that the initials for Hawk with an E were what I thought my name growing up, like when I was a little kid, I thought I had, because my mom taught me to clarify that I'm Eric with a K. I thought with a K was part of my name. So when people would say, what's your full name? I'd say it's Eric with a K Huberman. So if you take those initials and jumble it around, it's Hawk with an E. So not the craziest story, but I did like that I had personal meaning, but I didn't want to name it after myself. I thought that was actually cheesy, but there's a meaning when with the animal Hawk for me. There's a meaning with the letters in the you know acronym there. So had fun with it. Um, what is the next big entrepreneur ecosystem outside of SF, LA, NYC, and Austin? I, I mean, I think Boulder is always up and coming. I think that Las Vegas still has potential. I think Miami has potential. Seattle has a lot going on. Um, I, I think that, um, and also, I mean, honestly, Austin, I think has a, I think Austin's still on par with a lot of those I don't want to, this is not to be degrading, but tier two kind of places. Like there's not the ecosystem in Austin that LASF and New York, New York have. And I think that's okay. I think that to expect these smaller metro areas to compete with a LA, which has 15 million people and, you know, New York, et cetera, is going to be really tough. Uh, New York, San Francisco, and LA have the the population to actually launch companies and have all the resources. They've got the financial backing LA's got entertainment, New York's got fashion, uh, LA's got manufacturing. There's these things that you can't, you don't have in other places. So it takes having like a geographic, like fundamental advantage to have that big of a, you know, uh, ecosystem. So I think it's, a, I think what's going to end up happening actually is more of a bridging of ecosystems. I think this isolation is getting crazy. And honestly, in LA, a lot of companies go up to the beta, raise their second round, third rounds of funding because there's not the financial backing in LA. But now we've got Snapchat IPO. As soon as those lockouts finish, there's going to be a lot of cash fin flux in LA and that could change. Uh, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs starting their own agencies? Uh, number one, and I almost get uh, militant about this, actually know what you're doing. It is very easy to put up you know, XYX media on your business card and on a website and say, I am a marketing guy and I know social media because you have a Facebook page. Um, it's fraud, so be very careful to like go sell yourself as a social media expert when you don't have a, actually have expertise. Um, it's easy to get clients and like to start out and get a few people, but in the long run, you're going to burn a lot of bridges and you're going to build a terrible reputation for yourself. 
you know, we are fundamental. Like Hawk Media will not take money from people we don't feel we can make money for. And if we get into it and we start doing marketing, doing advertising, and we see that this isn't working, we'll tell people to save their money and you know go invest in another channel. Like we don't want to. We're very reputation driven, and that's frankly what I credit our success to, and being able to live up to that reputation, obviously. But I think that because we've been so diligent about doing things right, doing them the right way, taking care of people, and running this thing reputationally, we've been able to be, like, people feel good recommending us because we take care of people. If we don't do a good job, we, you know, make it work. And that's really important when you're going to start an agency. Like, number one, know what you're talking about because it's incredible to me how many people don't and sell a few clients. We, we, we've watched it a few times here where we've had a short employee here for a short time realize they fudge their resume, they talk through a good interview, it didn't work. We'll let them go. And then they'll go start an agency and say they got all their experience here. It's happened twice now. And it's ridiculous, but we don't promote it. We don't combat it. We let them do their thing because there's not really a fight for that. But I think that's the biggest issue with agencies and starting agencies is people a lot of times do it uh, as a shortcut thinking they don't need to learn anything. So how did I educate myself on marketing books uh, I recommend or possibly written on the, that are written on the topic? Uh, education came from trial. So I have had three e-commerce companies, and so I had to do it for myself. I literally went out and started, you know, trying to understand it, asking advice. Um, the whole like mentorship concept is a big thing for me because I don't believe in having one mentor that knows everything and is your your guru. Uh, I believe in finding people that are really good at specific things and tapping them for that. So. One guy that I tapped when I was, uh, my first e-commerce company, I didn't do this this type of marketing. It was actually very Craigslist driven. But my second one was very standard. It was Swag of the Month, it's t-shirt subscription site. And I went to the guy that was the number one subscription marketer that I think probably at the time period and got a hold of him, got connected through someone, asked for an intro. His name's Chris Nella. At the time he had run marketing for Gamefly and Shoe Dazzle. Shoe Dazzle being the subscription shoe company. And this was early, early, early in the whole sub e com space. And so there was, I mean, he was spending big budgets. And I went and took him to coffee like once a month and picked his brain. And he's a very nice guy and gave me guidance. And some really basic things like the secret to marketing is just trying things and testing. Like, <laughs> it's, there's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, if anyone's ever promising you an ROI, they're lying. Like, until you try and test, you have no idea. And that was really good feedback for me because now we have a lot of like, indicators and things that we've used that we can actually see what works, what doesn't, and we can jump ahead of that a little bit based on like the overall data we have across the hundreds of brands we work with. But initially, uh, it was just trying stuff. Um, and then in terms of things I've read, uh, I like blogs. Um, HubSpot has a good blog. Shopify has a good blog. We, you know, I'm biased, but I think we have a good blog now. We put out a couple pieces of content a day. So our, we have most of our team writes a blog post a month. So anywhere from email, Facebook search, influencer, affiliate, web design, strategy, just overall marketing tips. There's all these detailed articles as well as generalized ones coming up. So that's been fun. Uh, any other questions? Well, I take a bite of this food that I've been stirring the whole time. So, <laughs> got one bite in. Um, and my advice for finding mentors. Um, I, I, honestly, I, I kind of goes back to like, I like to say yes to everything until I learn my lesson. Meaning like, if I get invited to an event, if I get asked to go to drinks or coffee or whatever, I just say yes. And it's built a really cool network of people that I've been able to meet over the past few years because you never know who's gonna teach you something or who's gonna have something. And keeping in touch with those people Again, like I don't believe in having an, a specific mentor. I believe in having multiple people that are there with different expertise. And that for me changes all the time. I'll meet a guy, um, you know, I met, I met a guy recently that I was really impressed with the sales team he had built out and the way he had done it and the whole process. So I went and took him for lunch and picked his brain about building a sales team. Like that's to me mentorship. Like he is mentoring me on sales. I wouldn't call him my mentor. I don't think that like having again this guru mentor is the way to go. But he has he absolutely helped me look at my sales in a different way, and then it got reinforced by a couple other people, and now we've actually built a pretty solid sales process. So that was really helpful. Um, so I think what it is is identifying people that are doing a specific part of your business the way you want it to be done, and going and learning from that. Again, back to Chris Nella who taught me digital marketing, or you know. 
Andy, who was just taught me about the sales side, there's all these different people in my life that know different sides of the business that I reach out to. And, I, and in terms of meeting them, it's just through, the, again, being open and I'll, I'll eventually meet someone and then be like, oh, wow, you could really teach me a lot. Do you mind? And most people are very happy to do that. So what does it take to create a successful entrepreneur ecosystem? <sighs> a lot of things. Um, it. I watch, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur in LA and like in the tech scene for nine years now. So I've definitely watched a huge shift in LA. Um, and the things it takes to start, it takes like some bit, like what I've seen in this, I, I haven't done any studying on this, this is just sheer observation. It takes a, uh, a big company that has a lot of talent doing really well. I mean, and in this case, it started with MySpace. MySpace launched a bunch of entrepreneurs and people that cared about the entrepreneurship world and the startup world. And then you've got Diego and uh, Josh from uh, Beachman who went and started all these subscription companies. You've got Kevin Winston who started Digital LA that built like events around curating these people. You've got Mike Jones who started Science, the incubator that launched Dollar Shave Club. All these people came from MySpace. And you have that's, you know, and those things then started to, you know, once you have this inc stable, inc stable incubator, and this, you know, event program that people have a place to go every month to, you know, meet, or week to meet up, and you've got all these other companies starting out of it, then it starts to drive other people's inspiration to start it. It starts bringing in capital, because now there's, you know, there's finance people that go, oh, there's something here, let's start putting money into that. And that starts to grow it, because now there's an opportunity to start businesses that you can't just bootstrap. And there's an incentive for these entrepreneurs to go for it. And so then that starts to happen, then you end up with a few successes like, Dollar Shave Club, Honest Company, Snapchat, et cetera. And whether it's a big sale or an IPO, you end up with these bigger companies that are spinning out more people and it starts to you know, build a kind of snowball effect from what I've seen. Um, next question, how do you describe growth hacking or is it a buzzword? So it's both, it's a buzzword, but there's some, tr there's some le uh, legitimacy behind it. Basically the what I see growth hacking as how I define it is the product side of marketing, meaning like if you can do, you know, the viral loop side of marketing, the problem with it, you know, I'd say it's things like scraping on online to find your customer base and emailing them, things like that are a little more hacking involved and have to do with like, you know, it's kind of the crossover between marketing and development than it is just straight advertising marketing. And it's there's good and bad things early on it's really valuable because it's a great way i mean a gr an example of growth hacking from what i understand it as would be when linkedin made everyone spam their all their email lists to bring in a bunch of people not the nicest thing to do but at the end of the day it created a you know multi 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 billion dollar company uh because they curated so many people in so quickly from that hack and it was a hack it was absolutely what it was um so growth hacking to me is like that early bump that you can get the problem is it's hit or miss and it's not scalable generally so these kind of, you know, putting all your time into that, you'll get to a point in business where you realize like, you know, we've got to do something else at scale. And a lot of times you'll be starting from scratch on the marketing if you don't do both. But I do believe in a combination of both. So the future of Facebook Live and opportunities influencers brands can do with it. Okay, so there's a few things there. I mean, I think live video is going to, you know, we're all going to get to the point where there, it's just that's what, you know, every event, everything going on is going to have live video. And it's really interesting in that way. So... I like that aspect of Facebook Live. I think that, you know, they're the first, you know, Periscope and Meerkat were interesting, but Facebook has such a great platform that it's incentivized people to use Facebook Live. Where it's going, um, for brands, I think it's tough. I've watched brands using it a lot. We've had brands using it. And unless you have something really exciting, who cares about it being live? Like, you know, I, I, having lunch with me is obviously very exciting. So, <laughs> so this works right now. But in general, like, I think... You know, if you look at like what people care about live in general in entertainment, it's when there's like something happening that they don't want to miss out on that they can't just consume later. Meaning, uh, sports events where they're going to miss the you know the big, uh, the end game score and they're going to be out of the loop. But if it's a TV show, a lot most people are watching TV shows on demand later or by themselves and whatever. You know, Netflix changed a lot of that. Obviously, every you know HBO, Showtime, etc. All going on demand, so people don't care that it's you know this episode comes out at 7 p.m. on Sunday as much. They're just going to consume it whenever they want. So, when it's event driven, I think that Facebook Live can become very interesting. And so, if it's a big announcement from a company, if it's something that people are anticipating, then totally. But if it's just standard content, you're just going to bore people. 
that's kind of my view of it. Um, so what's up next for Hawk Media and what types of clients are we looking for? Uh, Hawk Media has a lot going on. <laughs> we, we've definitely grown like crazy and it's been awesome. We've just about finished an AI platform we're launching that allows us to benchmark companies in real time. And we, we basically are pulling in thousands of companies' marketing data so that we can look at what you're doing on your website you know, and your Google Analytics and go, hey, you're dropping the ball here. This is where the hole is in your company. This is where you're doing well. So this is what we need to focus on to market it. And we can do that instantly instead of like doing a full audit dive in over a few weeks. So that's really fun because we're always trying to be the best marketing company, period. That's what we're building here. Um, we, we launched a pop-up shop on Abbott Kenny, a co-retail space where we have 10 different e-commerce brands that are you can actually go in and shop and check it out. And it's the idea is we're rotating brands through that each throw their events throughout the month. So it's like an event space meets uh, a retail shop in a really good location. The idea being, you know, th it's a chance to actually touch and feel these brands. So that's been really fun. We also are throwing a very large event October 5th called Hawkfest. You can check it out at hawkfest.com, H-A-W-K-E-F-E-S-T.com. Uh, we're really excited about that because we're curating just the top e-commerce professionals in the world all together to basically lead discussions, activities. We're not doing a typical conference because, frankly, I think they're boring. So that's been uh, really fun to put together. And plus more, and in terms of clients we're looking for, honestly, the, we, we look cold for culture, not necessarily for company, meaning we market all sorts of random things all over the board successfully. We market a software that is for manufacturers to deal with compliance. And we're able to do that successfully. And then we market a ton of fashion companies and things too. So that's been really, uh, re it's been really fun to work with tons of different people and companies. But what we, where the, you know, fit or not comes in is when we're dealing with someone that isn't open to our suggestions, isn't open to working with us. And that's where we run into challenges. So it's really culturally driven. If the person's ready to work with us, ready to listen to us and be collaborative, it's always great. Um, what is a form of marketing you focus on the most and why? I think that question, I like the question because it's a really important point. There isn't, marketing is not a vacuum. Marketing is, is a general term and it needs to be generalized because people deal with attribution issues and things like that. I just realized I'm like got the chopsticks in the way. Um, people are dealing with attribution and like focusing on these detailed things and trying to put everything in marketing into a vacuum. Like is Facebook working or is email working or is influencer working? They all work together. It's all synergistic. So getting stuck into this idea of like what works the best doesn't work in and of itself. You need to understand logically what each marketing channel is doing for you and how they complement each other and have a robust integrated marketing approach or you're going to waste a lot of money. So I assume you're a busy guy, best pr productivity hack. Um, yeah, uh, my main productivity hack is using my email box as a to-do list. Uh, I try to get to inbox zero every day. And when I realize I have things I need to get done, I email them to myself. I have actually an app called Captio, C-A-P-T-I-O, that I it, you just type it and hit send and it emails to yourself. And it's really cool because then I can look and go, oh yeah, I had to do that, I have to do that. And then I just check things off and I just try to punch through everything in my email. A lot of those are emails to other people and things like that, but they're also the emails to myself of like, oh yeah, I've got to send that or I've got to do this or that. And then I just literally force myself to sit down and get through it. And that, uh, you know, it's one of those things where between my calendar being packed completely and my email like running like that, I don't care if I'm having a off day, if I'm, you know, everybody wakes up every once in a while and just doesn't want to deal with anything. Like everyone has an off, those off days. Doesn't matter. I still have my work to do and I do it. So like my productivity never suffers from my emotions or my mood because I just, I have my stuff to do and I do it. So it's been good. Um, Next question, can Youngery MC it? I actually definitely open a document about it. Uh, we're uh, happy to talk after this. And they're talking about Hawkfest, I believe. Uh, you said you have a retail store project. What opportunities can digital and offline do together? Good question. So digital, you still don't have the physical. You don't, like if we're selling fashion, like this shirt, very comfortable, maybe it looks comfortable, maybe it doesn't, but you have no idea unless you touch and feel it. Now, a lot of people are willing to take that risk because of return policies, but a lot of people do want to try something on and check it out before they buy it. With offline, you get that. We also get just straight visibility on Abbott Kenny. You get brand alignment like you would anywhere else. Like we're across the street from, you know, Warby Parker and Casper and all these cool shops in Abbott Kenny. And now all our brands are associated with those brands. So there's, depending on how you look at retail, there's the just straight revenue aspect of it. But when you're going to flagship locations like where we are in Abbott Kenny, 
frankly, revenue is not going to equate. You're going to they're going to lose money if they're just looking at revenue. But all the benefits of driving people online, of getting their customers in for experiences, you build a more core client that way. So that's been good. And sorry if you can hear the noise in the background. This office is always kind of going off. Um, and can Snapchat be used for marketing campaigns successfully? It's too early. Uh, we don't bother. We've tried. We've tested marketing campaigns on Snapchat. Um, it's not making money for people. So we, you know, one thing I've actually learned a lot about marketing is you don't need to be ahead of the game. Like people jump on things like AR, VR, Snapchat, etc., thinking like we've got to be in front of this. We've got to be the first one to do this. And there's there's an award in Can Lion for you, at the big marketing conference. There's a few things that you get from being that first mover, but generally you don't have to be that innovative to be a good marketer. You can use the channels and use the things that are working. Innovation comes with the creative and with the content. It doesn't have to come with the channel. Um, but and it can, but I, I would say don't rush to just jump on every chat platform that comes out. So what opportunities are there still in AI for consumers focused or for consumer focused entrepreneurs? I mean, I think that there's no limit to the opportunities. I think, you know, what we're building is trying to build out an AI that actually understands marketing on a macro level so it can, you know, adjust marketing for companies automatically. But I think that hasn't been scratched yet. I mean, AI, according to Ray Kurzweil, won't even be in a place of commercial viability until 2029. So I, I think that everything's the opportunity there. Um, best tips for pitching for money. Um, yeah, if, it depends on what stage you're in, but assuming you're talking about early stage when you're first trying to get money, because later it's just the numbers. Um, early on, you've got to be the right person to do it. Like we, we, We've done some angel investments. We work with a ton of funds, and the biggest thing they're looking for is what's the unfair advantage we have here because of the management team? Why are you the one to do it? I don't care how good your idea is. Ideas aren't worth anything, and I'm, I'm sorry to be that blunt, but it's just true. Everyone has good ideas, really. But if I came out and said, I've got the best idea for – an AI platform right now. Let's just take that. I, I'm spending my own money on it to build it out. But if I was trying to get other people to give me money, I would be, I mean, maybe because of our strategic advantage as someone to deploy it, they'd give it to us. But if it was just me, if I left Hawk, I sold it, it was just me, and they just know I'm a smart guy, but I'm saying I'm going to build an AI platform, I'd be very hesitant to give me money, especially if it had nothing to do with marketing. Let's say I'm building AI to help farmers manage their crops. I have no farming background. I have no connections in farming. I have no tech background. I have no connections there. I, they just be betting on me being a hustler. What I look for is someone that like they can. Not only are they that person that can make it happen, but they're also they have some advantage to be you know that they can leverage. Um, all right, I've got time for one more question. So, what have I done with big data at Hawk? Our last talk uh, with Richard Burt was great. Yeah, so big data that goes back to our AI platform. We're using big, big data to teach our uh, AI platform what works and what doesn't in marketing. We're pulling in all the data we have access to so that we can actually look in the aggregate based on industry, based on all sorts of different variables, what you know, what works, what doesn't, and actually start to use that for clients for our own marketing purposes to quickly learn what's you know going on in the marketplace. So last question is, what's the next space you want to get into? Um, we're looking into the finance side of things. We are, you know, we're, we're exploring the idea of having a seed fund out of Hawk to for marketing software mainly, where we can deploy things with things we're looking for. We can actually finance to get done. Um, so things like, uh, you know, let's say someone comes up with a really good automa e marketing automation platform that we actually would use and like, we'd love to be able to invest in it too and be a partner in that because honestly, at this point, we've got, again, hundreds of clients we could deploy it on, we'd be a good strategic partner. So that's something we're exploring. But frankly, we, we're still just getting started. Like the core is marketing, the core is being the best marketer in the country, in the world. And I think we've come a long way and I think we're probably in, you know, near first place as far as our ROI and our marketing chops. But now I want that first place to be a a lot further distant from second place. And that's what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Feel free to contact me. Uh, it's My email is eric, E-R-I-K, at hawkmedia.com. Don't forget there's an E at the end of Hawk. Uh, I'm on all platforms at Eric Huberman. So it's you know on Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook, it's slash Eric Huberman. On in LinkedIn, it's something slash Eric Huberman. So feel free to reach out. Happy to answer more questions offline. Happy to connect with any of you. So thank you again.